Welcome ladies and gentlemen to the official Mohaba DeFi channel. My name is Moby Sadiq and I'm delighted to be joined by our amazing guest today, Amir San Roberto, who is the head of investor relations at Mohaba, and Cecilia Wong, who is the head of public relations. So it's an exciting time for Mohaba, of course. We recently released the white paper, the Sharia green paper. And if you're a subscriber to this channel, which I hope you are, then of course you will know some exciting partnerships which our guests will be talking about. But before I introduce our guests, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and hit that bell notification so you never miss out on the latest and greatest from Mohaba DeFi. So without further ado, welcome to the broadcast, Amir and Cecilia. Thank you so much. Thank for you, Mavi. Awesome, awesome, Thank guys. You. So, so Amir, let's start with yourself. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are? Well, thank you, Mavi. Thank you so much for having us. Delighted to be here. Well, my name is Amir. I am from Central Asia, Uzbekistan. I have been in blockchain since 2016. I joined Marahaba proudly almost five months ago. And ever since, I've been enjoying the ride. And uh, I, I did invest in a couple of other projects. Uh, I run a couple of projects in Shanghai, China, two in New York, and one in Sydney. That's very shortly about myself, Bobby. <laughs> right, awesome, awesome. Uh, and uh, what about uh, yourself, Cecilia? Tell us about how you, I guess, came, you know, became part of Merhaba and I guess the the fantastic, you know, team. Well, um, I first heard about Merhaba from Amir, actually, um, whom I know because we work at Cinefy. Um, you know, I I, I um, am a managing partner of Cinefy for the Singapore chapter, and so. He introduced Merhaba to me as a DeFi project that was faith-based, and he asked me what I thought of it. And um, at that moment, my ears perked up immediately because um, I hadn't heard of any faith-based project um, in DeFi. And believe me, I've heard of um, so many types of projects. And I would say the focus of the majority of the um, DeFi projects was usually on money and technology. So um, I was immediately intrigued by the faith-based um, and ethics-based aspects. Um, and then I listened in on a couple of internal meetings where the concepts of um, sh uh, Sharia compliance were being explained. I met up with um, some of the core team, Nakib, um, Khalid, uh, Dr. Ferg, uh, Denise. And I mean, the team is pretty amazing. So one thing led to another, and here I am managing PR from Rahab. Amazing, amazing. So speaking of Mohaba, I mean, why don't you tell us a little bit about the story behind Mohaba and how it began and why essentially it matters? Well, that's a really good question. Um, nine months ago, Nagib reached out to me. Um, I'm an investor and co-founder at Sinofi. Sinofi primarily helps um, tech companies access China and Asia Pacific markets. And obviously Asia Pacific is on the rise. So Nagib at the time, was looking for a market penetration across mainland of China and looking for investment. So during our first encounter, as just like Cecilia said, I was very interested in Sharia compliance because I'm quite aware of the subject matter. I know what it looks like and being the Muslim, it gave me a very clear sense of idea. And I had never seen prior to Marhaba any kind of project. In fact, I haven't seen any project within 50 Muslim countries that could empower um, excluded communities. So at the time, we just decided to help Sinofi entirely free of charge. And I was extremely interested about the future of the project. After a couple of months, Nakib reached out to me and said, we want you to have a chat with Khalid, who is the chairman of, of Marhaba. And after two hours of conversation, not only I was convinced, but I also decided to allocate my personal resources from Sinofi to Marhaba, amplify its presence as well as its significance across the markets. So that was a sort of first thing on a personal level that motivated me. Um, why it matters. If you look at the overall situation um, that is happening worldwide in most of the Muslim countries that seem to be excluded for a number of reasons, one of them could be the faith-based um, issue, Two, it's about the complexities of DeFi. It looks kind of com um, complicated. The blockchain idea itself for majority, for middle class or lower middle class um, people, it's kind of hard to understand. And, and third of all, it's in emerging or developing countries 
more and more people are trying to get used to that. But uh, the, the entry level, it's so hard. And Marhaba gives the answer to all of these challenges. Hence, I thought that's where Marhaba fits and I have to become part of it in order to take the project to the next level. And then afterwards, Cecilia came along. Like, literally, I had to convince her, giving her abilities and knowing the market in terms of the PR and media relations, which is the best at. Um, and, and she proudly joined the team, for which we are very grateful. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. I've actually got a couple of follow-up questions to that. But just on the actual Islamic financial sector, Ami, you know, speaking of that, how big is it? And, you know, are there any competitors? You mentioned there's nothing else like it. But talk to me a little bit about, I guess, just the market opportunity. Well, I was talking to Halit about this question because Halit has almost two decades of experience in Islamic finance. And during our conversation, he said Islamic finance amounts for, amounts for a $3 trillion industry. Today's total locked value of DeFi is about $149 or $150 billion and zero in Islamic DeFi. And he gave me this sort of idea, think of 1% of $3 trillion. We're talking about $30 billion. That really blew my mind. And I looked into, I did my personal research, obviously. I was looking at um, Dubai or Arabic Emirates. I was looking at, at the Saudi Arabia or Middle East Gulf region in overall. Um, I, I haven't seen any Muslim-focused inclusive project that was answering this question. And as a matter of the fact, as, as, as soon as I got into Islamic finance reports and I started reading them, uh, most of the banking systems are all about 100, maybe 200 years old. Nothing has changed except for the fintech part of it, meaning user experience has changed, but fundamentally system is the same. So Marhaba brings this DeFi disruption on the table, opening the gate, not to millions, but billions of people. And that's when I thought, okay, this is $3 trillion industry. We're talking about $150 billion total value locked and zero DeFi in Islamic um, countries. And this, we are the first sort of blue ocean mover kind of people. And we have to penetrate market and make things happen as soon as possible, just to give you the context. And that, that this, this three numbers in terms of the three trillion for Islamic finance, $150 billion total value locked in DeFi itself and zero in Islamic DeFi sort of identified my commitment towards Marhaba. Understood, understood. So Cecilia, I've I've got a question for yourself on this. Obviously, you know, you guys have spoken a little bit about, you know, the actual impact, the actual market size of the Islamic community, the fact that that market isn't really being attended to. But what do you think the benefit is? Or cause, because we always talk about, you know, you always see this if, if you guys follow and please check out the Telegram group, check out the website. There is a lot of, you know, about the 8,000 fans that are in there. There's a lot of non-Muslims there too, right? So what's the appeal to non-Muslims? We talk about Marhaba being an inclusive, you know, protocol as opposed to uh, Muslim only. Well, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, besides the faith-based angle, I was also very attracted to the ethics-based angle, um, which I thought was something much needed in the DeFi space. Um, but when you come back to the faith-based angle and you look at the Abrahamic religions in a historical context, you will find that there are similar views on the interest, um, on the issue of interest or riba. Uh, the chief principles in Abrahamic religions promote uh, the practice of benevolence and um, philanthropy. And um, so I suppose, you know, in terms of um, interest, types of um, financial practices, uh, some of these kinds of um, principles might be uh, might 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 not be um, respected. And that is something that, um, you know, I thought was interesting when um, I came across the Merhaba. So essentially, um, I think that Ethical investing is not something that is only restricted to um, Muslims, but it is also a, a concern. I think that is um, that is uh, for Muslim, uh, for non-Muslim people. Uh, so, what um, is great about Muhabba is it's also it's a Muslim also type of project and not just based on um, 
you know, it's Islam, Muslim community. I completely agree. And, you know, I often have said on, you know, the this channel before that, funnily enough, Islam Sharia principles have a risk mitigation strategy built in, isn't it? It's almost like, you know, Islamic investing in finance has a security blanket, like, you know, uh, margin trading, leverage trading, those things aren't allowed. So it, you're right. Those things absolutely have universal appeal. Uh, so me moving on to yourself, um, give us a little bit of an idea of today's crypto market, you know, where we're at and, you know, Merhaba fits. I think you've answered this a little bit already, but just give us an idea where Merhaba fits into the rest of the, the, the crypto market at large at the moment. Well, thank you for the question, Mavi. Well, earlier I was talking specifically from the Islamic finance perspective that that is the um, three trillion dollar industry, and there is nothing has been done in Islamic DeFi perspective. But going back to your current question, um, by definition, DeFi is empowering the unbanked people. And if you look at the numbers, when we were working on the deck, um, we were just typically blown away. The, the more we looked at the numbers, the more I was fascinated personally. Um, currently, right now, the market capitalization of, of overall cryptocurrencies is about $2 trillion. More than 90% of people are positive about digital assets, cryptocurrencies, and the way they're moving forward. And when you look at the Binance, one of the biggest exchanges by, by far, um, in, in other exchanges or decentralized exchanges on daily basis, $100 billion that are on volume so far. And the return is significant. But probably 3% of the population on the planet are benefiting. When I say 3%, it's about more than 200 million people. And those are the people who are either well-trained, they, they have a better understanding how to trade, and it's purely on a speculative purposes where you jump in, you make quick buck, and then you leave and you speculate. But those that we are talking about, um, those that have hard time understanding complexities, it could be millennials, it could be um, the next generation or slightly old generation. They have no idea. They are very conservative. By far, Marhaba is not reinventing the wheel or innovating anything, but what personally attracts me is the social impact. It's caring for those who are left behind, taking them by the hand, telling them this is how it works. We're sharing compliant people and we're going to help you to use your funds and utilize resources we're building for you and stay away from speculation. I think that's the one of the massive value proposition that Marfa brings on the table in this massive industry. Essentially, we are developing completely new infrastructure within the infrastructure. And when I say zero in Islamic DeFi, that's where we're tapping. And just like Cecilia said earlier, it's not Muslim only, but Muslim also inclusive, universal. And Sharia law has nothing to do with, with Muslims only. It's universal law, just like any constitution of any country. The fact that Sharia law, Sharia law um, it goes back to the seventh century, uh, unchanged completely, um, it has its appeal to me personally. So there is no room for negotiations. There is no room for bribery. There is no room for any kind of corruption. We're dealing with the universal compliance and building the product. And that what appeals to me personally. So the ecosystem is kind of unique. It's fantastic. And it has uh, uh, probably a, a product that answers many questions for Muslims and other who are not Muslims or non-Muslims who are interested or might be interested in joining Marhaba to benefit from its future offerings. Yeah, I love it. Those those principles of safety, risk mitigation, they're, they're universal. And from the Muslim side, and one of the things that appealed to me is there is so much complexity, right? I mean, like there is so much to look into as a, as a Muslim investor. I don't have time to read everything and is this halal or that not halal? So it, it takes the guesswork out. Um, so my next question is the ecosystem that you mentioned, how will it serve the community? And specifically, what steps will be taken to accelerate that adoption? Because obviously the learning curve is is quite steep for, for the masses. Well, the good point that you brought up, Mabe, is just we don't have time to sit down and read white papers. And we spend an enormous amount of time developing white papers, slide papers, Sharia paper, the deck. It's just endless amount of hours of work and refining and research. 
Um, there are, the, the, the Marhaba has three lines of businesses and every single line, it's sort of independent business entity and it could be treated as a completely separate business Theoretically speaking, um, three of the lines that I'm talking about, the first one is the Sahal wallet. Um, I live in Shanghai, China, and in China, there is one of the apps. It's called WeChat. We call it super app. It's like a gateway in using hundreds of different services. Using single app, you can, you can, you can use the Uber. You can use Amazon. You can use um, PayPal. So think of this hundred apps compiled in a single app. And when I look at Marhaba, Marhaba is doing something identical, just like WeChat did in China, which has over a billion number of users by four within within six years time or seven seven years of time. So Sahal Wallet is the gateway, just like WeChat. And it will open the door to use all the Marhaba offerings in a long run. Right now it's on a beta test. We're testing on Android phones. And that's the first sort of uh, a business line or the product. The second one is NFT. Um, Cecilia probably is one of the fans of NFT, and we talk a lot about NFT industry. But Marhaba is the sort of game changer in terms of bringing um, NFT from the Sharia perspective. As you know, um, it's, it's, um, there are definite bans on what you can and what you cannot sort of disclose um, when it comes to visual perspective. And NFT Marketplace is another product, mind-blowing product, that I think would be a game changer. It would attract millions of um, artists from not only Muslim countries, but also from other countries. And the third one is all about DeFi. And in, in DeFi, one of the products that really excites me, it's a liquidity harvester. And we have been talking to Dr. Farouk, who is a Sharia expert, with Halak, who has 20 years of experience in Islamic banking. And the more we looked into uh, idea of Ruba that Cecilia mentioned earlier, the idea of Mudoraba. Um, one thing that really caught my attention, it's not about uh, letting people use kind of some kind of system and get interest from them, but sharing the risk that got my attention immediately. So um, this is one of the additional perks um, why I joined Marhaba. Fantastic. Thanks, Adami. So um, Cecilia, I might ask you about the liquidity harvester. Now, me personally, I can sort of tell you as someone who loves to stake and provide liquidity and, and, and God, it can be really confusing, right? Um, this really got me interested, you know, the idea that there was a liquidity harvester. So, uh, and I'm sure there's others out there as well. So it seems like a, a, a big deal, but it is, of course, different from other interest based decentralized exchanges or, or other things that are not so compliant. So tell us a little bit high level about the liquidity harvester and, and, and how it might be different from those other protocols. Um, well, the liquidity harvester uh, is a liquidity harvesting protocol. So it's not really like a DEX so much. I mean, there are of course similarities. Um, I think the closest that um, we could um, um, compare this would be to some kind of optimizer type of a uh, um, uh, protocol, like I a yearn, uh, like a yearn finance thing type of thing. Something like something like that, yeah. Um, because uh, what it does basically is um, it 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 has um, a cross chain. Uh, it is cross chain, of course, uh, liquidity harvesting protocol where users can earn profits um, by depositing their coins into liquidity pools and then they earn returns through trading fees. And then what is, um, I think some of the other uh, projects are doing this at the moment as well, um, you know, like the optimizers that I was uh, referring to earlier on. What uh, it, it does is um, they help you to dynamically, um, automatically, find the highest yielding um, liquidity pools. But of course, the um, liquidity harvester from um, Merhaba, they find you the highest yielding halal liquidity pools. Um, you know, those that have um, the highest combination of expected trading volumes and commissions of the different pairs of uh, Sharia compliant crypto assets. and. Like I mentioned earlier on, it, um, they are cross chain, so it's across the various chains and underlying DEX protocols. Um, and then, you know, they automatically uh, select these um, pools for you and invest 
in these rules and you know get the best yields for you so it's almost like um you don't have to think about um which which pools you know you need to go in you know let's say you're a muslim and you're like oh i want to be sh uh, sh sharia compliant you know you don't have to think about which mm. pools you need to choose you know that the, the pools are already halal um for uh with the liquidity harvester and um at the same time um um, it also offers you all the things that are available um, on the market. You know, it's cross chain, and not 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 everything right now. Not um, many of the uh, um, uh, the protocol protocols. Uh, yeah. Yes, not many of the protocols are cross chain yet, and this is something that uh, I believe um, is um, very cool about the Mahaba Liquidity Harvester because it is cross chain. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. I that that I love that, and the fact again, it's kind of like the sh it's not it's like, kind of like the Sharia side, not worrying about what coins to invest in, but on this side, like because just literally two days ago on our last uh, Mahaba Crypto show, and if you guys aren't watching, make sure you like, comment, subscribe. We, we share a lot of great stuff there. I was talking to Ahmed about the fact that you know Ethereum staking and Solana staking, and he actually mentioned he he, he gave me some information that. Ethereum staking is not the same as Solana staking. So Ethereum staking is overwhelmingly halal most of the time and Solana staking at the moment in its current form is overwhelmingly not halal. You know, it's, it's haram right now. So the fact that, and I'm like, wow, what do you mean? Isn't it the same? So the fact that those things are already there and, and verified, and I do know that this is one of the big features that's attracted a lot of non-Muslim investors as well. And I want to talk to you guys a little bit later about partnerships. But I mean, just kicking it back to yourself, you know, talk to us about, obviously we spoke about the liquidity harvester, um, uh, you know, you touched on the NFT side as well. What are the other, what in summary, what are the main user cases of the Mahaba token? Well, I want to, before I answer that question, just additionally give a little bit more information. One other thing that I have noticed, particularly in Liquidity Harvester, um, we look at Marhaba at investors, be it the uh, um, individual retail investor or those who will be participating in public sale, um, as the people not only who would be utilizing the token, but also Marhaba would be acting in, in terms of Liquidity Harvester as the fund manager. Uh, on, one, on, on one hand, one has to understand that we're not making any money out of interest, but we're sharing any kind of difficulties with users together. So um, when it says the Reba Modaraba, it's the sort of engagement where we share the risk together and we share the revenue together. So that's a sort of a friendship or the contract in which two parties participate. To me personally, it looks very fair versus in other platforms, um, it's purely interest. They don't care what happens to you, and they keep, in a bad terms, ripping you off. So that's sort of um, on a personal level what I think. And to consolidate the, the ecosystem or infrastructure, just to answer your question, for example, um, future projects that want to come in into Marhaba ecosystem, they have to be Sharia approved. And for that, they have to pay the fee, the service fee, meaning in Marhaba token. Uh, we spoke about NFT, obviously. And uh, Marhaba NFT platform will require fees to be paid in Marhaba uh, uh, in MRHB. The same applies for, for marketplace user users that want to buy or sell a Marhaba NFT or participate in marketplace may may pay the transaction fee in Marhaba token, which will attract lower transaction fee. Liquidity Harvester, one of the best products, um, use of the Liquidity Harvester will require users to pay fees in Marhaba. Pretty much everything. There are multiple other um, possibilities that we have indicated in a white paper is designed to make sure that it's not the token for the sake of token, so people could trade and benefit from it, but actually increase the usability that would increase the token value in the long run. So that's, so that's a sort of overall objective. If I could answer your question, Moby. Awesome. Thank you, me. Perfect. Um, so, Cecilia, a question for yourself. Uh, obviously the telegram community, I think next time I log in, it'll probably be 8,000 now. So if you're obviously interested, definitely join that telegram community for people watching. Um, a question I see all the time, right? Is when can I buy this thing? Where can I buy this thing? Uh, so for those who don't know, why don't you, you know, share a bit of an answer, you know, where can they actually buy the token and, and where will it be listed initially? 
Well, you can't actually buy it right now because the token is not public yet. Um, we're just done with the seed funding round, um, which has been an amazing journey for the team um, as it has forged a lot of bonds and developed team spirit amongst us. It gave us a lot of confidence actually to move forward as we see the support and interest from potential investors, strategic partners, and just the community in general. Um, so if you're interested in getting on board now, there are actually two more private rounds left, the private whitelist and the exclusive entry before we open it up to public sale. And um, at the moment, we're in the midst of signing um, strategic partnerships uh, with various exchanges. And one of them is Coinsbit India, who has been offering us great community support um, even early on, uh, this early on in our journey. Um, yeah, I mean, they've been just very, very, very amazing uh, in terms of uh, social media community support for us. Um, at the moment, more partnerships are being explored and we will be happy to announce them when they're ready. Awesome. Awesome. Fantastic. So, um, Amir, obviously, you know, 2017, 2018, we had ICO scandals and rug pulls. And, you know, unfortunately, it is just par for the course, really. I don't think that's ever going to go away in the world of crypto. Uh, but one concern investors do have, whether they're going to be, you know, private seed round investors or, or public investors is, um, you know, like auditing and rug pulls. So my question is, has Merhaba been audited and are there any protections against scams and, you know, potential rug pulls? Thank you, um, Abhi, for this question. This is probably one of the frequently asked questions within our team. And so far right now, we partner with Ukraine-based um, company called Hacken that is working with us from the very beginning in order to ensure that um, we, we do have all required resources and tools to prevent from this kind of hacking happens. Obviously, we started our discussion with Cervic and, and Zeppelin to consolidate our positions to audit on a quarterly basis, uh, addressing these questions. And uh, not only we have decided to increase our budget to make sure that we are not attacked, or even when we are attacked by the hackers, we do have all the required tools ready, but also in the future um, in Ukraine, where I have a um, significant number of developers, chances are very high we will start developing hackathons, and we're going to have a bounty programs uh, for those who will be helping Marhaba, making sure that we're solid, we're safe, we're secure. And um, that's the, probably one of the important questions that we'll be discussing on a quarterly basis during our future conferences that will be organized and powered by Marhaba. Yeah, awesome. Exciting stuff. Um, so, Cecilia, obviously you're head of PR at Marhaba. It'd be remiss of me not to ask you about marketing. And as, as a marketing, as a person with a marketing background myself, the, it was a question that I had as well. What are you guys doing to, I guess, expand the reach and expand the audience? What are you guys doing to really kind of get the word out? Because, you know, it... This stuff can sound really complicated, so often I think the challenge is to simplify that. So how are you guys getting the word out? Well, I'll start with the PR strategies, which um, is mainly about getting our name and our branding out there in the public and in the media. So uh, we have been doing that uh, by announcing developments in the community and the partnerships formed during our fundraising journey. We have been able to garner a lot of public interest in Baraba as a project. But what I would like to stress that um, because our USP is really ethics and um, faith, uh, this has been the part that has generated a lot of interest in the media. Um, every time we put out a news release, we get lots of organic pickups. And of course, I also want to mention that, you know, uh, we don't want to forget some of our media partners and community partners who have been very just amazing and supporting our announcements too but besides them you know people who don't know about us they also come on and they um start uh picking up our announcements and our news and it is really because uh you know the project itself is um something that i feel uh is reaching out to people uh in terms of um how it's positioned as a um, ethical and inclusive and um, faith faith based um, project. So, in terms of marketing, uh, we will also be collaborating with a number of our investors, uh, who also happen to be our strategic partners. Um, in fact, 
um, most of the investors who have come on, uh, they have been helping us a lot uh, in terms of uh, giving us marketing support through their channels. And um, so the cross marketing that we have been able to uh, do and are continuing to do um, will be part of the strategy that we will be adopting to continue to expand the, our audience and to expand the reach of the project. Fantastic. Thank you, Cecilia. Uh, Amir, I feel, I feel like you've kind of already touched on this, so feel free to, to make this one brief if you like. But uh, as far as the tokenomics go, of course, the more people use it, you know, the utility goes up. But what are the tokenomics and how do you think that's going to increase over time? Well, first, I want to give credit to Cecilia um, before she joined the team um, that the overall PR and exposure was extremely slacking. And once she joined the team, within a week, we got probably more than 200 publications, which went completely mad. And ever since the number of interested parties, strategic partners in particular, investors that started literally chasing us just tripled in a matter of weeks. So um, I, I personally didn't know that in a matter of weeks, this had the results that he could achieve. And Cecilia did show the, the capabilities that she had and talent that she had and the creative way of thinking about the content that she had. I just wanted to publicly recognize her involvement in the project and we're very thankful for that on behalf of Sinopi as well as Marhaba, of course. Um, Mavi, to come back to your question, um, I gave a couple of examples earlier, as you said, the idea is to develop ecosystem where people would have usability of the token and the more utilities for the token we have we create uh, more token holders um, therefore the price of the token will appreciate um, in most cryptocurrencies the way it, it works is uh, some some projects just to create token for the sake of creating it and benefit from their investors or uh, utilizing the uh, from speculation but in case of marhaba it's all about giving value to the end user the token holder um, to giving freedom and opportunities to entrepreneurs. For example, if you're an entrepreneur, you want to be part of Marhaba, obviously you have to, as I said earlier, pay the fees for sharing experts who would be reviewing your project. Once they give a green light to you, you might want to use um, either our NFT platform or you want to use a, a launch pad. Um, as long as you pay in Marhaba tokens, you benefit from all the discounts and our community and Marhaba team, be it the Sharia Governance Board or the um, 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 uh, governance, bar, governance Board overall, we will be supporting all our um, partners, just like Google or Amazon. They do inquire projects, they incubate projects. So as Marhaba is planning to incubate and help its strategic partners to grow and making sure that we address all those questions that we mentioned earlier in the beginning, approximately 50 Muslim countries and less developed non-Muslim countries, they need help and we're simplifying the message and welcome, welcoming them aboard. And as we said, we, we, want, we want to use the Sharia compliance as the fundamental sort of law to, to run the overall project and run the show. Um, Mavi, if it answers your question, I'm happy to follow up with more if you have. No, absolutely. That makes sense. There's, there's genuine utility there. There's genuine, and you spoke about the fact that if people also want compliance and as this market grows and grows, you know, you can see that utility. So uh, in short, it's definitely no Shiba Inu coin. <laughs> it actually has utility. So that, that, that's great to hear. Um, look, probably one of my final questions for yourself and me, who, uh, I mean, you guys mentioned already, you know, Cecilia mentions Coinsbit, um, uh, and obviously there's obviously Cinefy, the, the, the great team at Cinefy as well, yourselves. Are there any other major partners, investors? I know there's been some new ones announced. And also, is there a strategy to get more and more partners, uh, you know, in the Mojave ecosystem as time goes on? Well, I'll cover primarily uh, from the investor standpoint, and I'm sure Cecilia might have more from the PR and marketing standpoint. Um, since we onboarded Shisha Finance, um, not only they brought unbelievably huge contribution in terms of the visibility and exposure in Middle East and the world, which, which entailed um, even more investors coming and talking to us, um, um, the domino effect was the number of retail investors probably went like X five times more. So we had um, um, French citizens based in Saudi Arabia investing significant amount of their wealth. We had uh, a number of um, uh, other Saudi 
Dubai-based retail investors coming in and allocating their resources. As in, as in now, we're talking to probably 12 additional VCs and we're making our selection based on the value proposition that they bring on the table. Um, we're no more interested in capital injection for the sake of benefiting from the project, but we're insisting that when VCs bring additional capital, they have to have some kind of community. They have to have some kind of impact. They have to have their voice in order to make sure that we align our marketing and PR activities with their team in order to utilize the time correctly and save a lot more time and expenses on the other hand. As, the, as you said, within the Sinophi, we're helping not only across Asia Pacific or China by definition. Um, we do have a significant number of technical team presence in Ukraine and Russia and Belarus. We speak 12 languages already. And as I was saying earlier, um, to increase the security, we would be hiring more tech people and most of them are based in Ukraine. Interestingly, Ukraine, one of the unique countries that probably manufactures all those talented engineers. And the first hackathon, according to our sort of ideation, is going to be held in Ukraine. Um, so this are the sort of latest news that we have that I could publicly um, disclose. Maybe, Cecilia, you might have some additional news I might not be aware of. Um, in terms of partnerships, yeah, partnerships and yeah, whether they're marketing or, or yeah, pure partnerships or upcoming coverage. Well, right now I think that um, we are getting some more strategic partners who are going to help us with marketing. Um, one of them is DCI Dutch Crypto Investors. Um, they we're really happy that they're getting um, on board the project. Um, you know, they're going to offer us a, a lot more um, marketing possibilities. Uh, New Tribe Capital as well. Um, I mean, basically, all the um, partners that were that are coming on, they're all really happy to, uh, to help us um, utilize their communities to market the project. So um, I think that's how we're going to be able to extend our reach. Yeah, fantastic, guys. This is uh, I'm conscious of your time as well. You guys have been very generous already. Uh, before I, I guys, I, I guess to close it off. Any passing comments, any passing thoughts, anything you think worth sharing um, that you guys already uh, haven't done so? Well, I could start from my end. That, um, we're looking for chief marketing officer in the team who is bilingual, obviously. It's not only open for Muslims, it's open for non-Muslims. We, we don't judge people based on their religion or ethnic belonging, but we do make our judgment based on their talents, creativity and capabilities and skill set. So that's the first. Second, we are aggressively uh, recruiting or looking for ambassadors. We do have probably one of the best cases in CIS region, one of the who has his own school. And um, since he joined the team as an ambassador, uh, the, the number of interested parties or individuals in Marahaba just went really crazy. It, it went north. We have more than 2,000 people interested in participating in public sale within the CIS region. And um, we would be extremely keen to look for this kind of people within the European Union, for example, within North Africa. Um, Turkey is one of the uh, important strategic um, locations for us. So we always look for people in Turkey. And obviously across the Gulf region and Asia Pacific. Um, on my end, this had a sort of uh, concluding comments. Maybe Cecilia might have some more. Well, for me, I think that, um, you know, I think that Mahaba is just a start, you know, like uh, right now with, uh, you know, when this gets off the ground and, um, you know, in DeFi, we start to get uh, projects that are more into uh, building ethical and inclusive frameworks. I think it's it's actually just a start to new ways um, that um, people are able to exchange value with each other, new ways that, um, you know, people are able to um, even actually see value. So, I mean, I'm very excited about that because I think that, um, you know, it's it's time for, you know, a change. It's time for people to start um, seeing that there are better ways to conduct our economies, better ways to um, exchange value. And I, I believe that this is, um, you know, a step in the right direction. 
Fantastic. Awesome. Awesome, guys. I hope everyone watching um, got value out of, you know, some more people behind the scenes, you know, the, the hardworking individuals in the Mojave team. So, guys, thank you so much for, for sharing that. I know you're very busy right now with, with everything that's happening and all the investments and all the investors. So, guys, if you enjoyed this, uh, if you got any value uh, at all, please like, comment, subscribe, drop a comment. I'm sure uh, uh, Cecilia and me would love to sort of hear from you and um, you know just keep posted this is I guess one of the first of, of many I guess uh, insights we're, we're also going to get members of the Sharia board we're going to bring uh, Nikki on as well so guys stay tuned you're in the right place and uh, we'll join you next time thank you thank you so much thank you